Hey there, and welcome back to another My Hero Academia review. And today we're diving into the final episode of the first arc of Season 5, which is essentially a Christmas special, with some sprinkled in hero training and foreshadowing of what's to come in the second half of the season. But before we get into all that, I just want to let you guys know that I have read the manga and I'm aware of any relevant future plot points and details. But for the purpose of these reviews, I only like to talk about what the anime has presented up to now and not go back and forth between the manga and the anime. It just helps to keep the reviews streamlined and allows anime-only fans to watch along and join in too. But that being said, let's get started. We start off the episode with a cold open and an ominous little title screen of Nine Days Ago, accompanying some pretty daunting and grim music as we find ourselves in Daika City with Deku's voice narrating. He says that the events of Daika City were the prologue to the tragedy that would follow, with the seeds of disaster being planted whilst they are unaware of the dangers. And of course, this spooky narration is overlaid over the image of half the city getting leveled by what seems at first to be some kind of earthquake. We then see a little lone flower has survived the carnage only to get stomped by a bloodied foot. A foot belonging to none other than Shigaraki, the leader of the League of Villains, who's covered in blood, and is no longer covered in his creepy hands, and begins to laugh maniacally. So, yeah, this is a pretty heavy opening, and is obviously setting the stage for what's going to happen in the second half of the season and will probably have a flow-on effect into the next couple of arcs, I suspect. Clearly, at some point, we're going to delve deeper into what happened to Daika City and what he's been up to since the Overhaul arc, but I suspect that for a while, it's going to be kept shrouded in mystery and almost like a little detective case that the heroes have to unravel before the real carnage kicks off. Regardless, I think this is the point where the story starts to take an even darker turn. We then have the opening, and then we move on to the rest of the episode. We then get a very brief recap of Bakugo and Todoroki destroying the low-level villains, before the shot pans out, revealing they're being interviewed for their heroics by a TV reporter who praises their pro-level work. And this whole little sequence is so ridiculous in so many glorious ways. Whether it's the fact that Bakugo wants to be a rich and famous hero and yet doesn't realise he has to be good with the press, the fact that Shoto has an intensely serious face, the fact that they're purposely sitting as far away from each other on the couch as possible, their hilarious bickering over whether they're actually friends or not, and the fact that Ida, Deku, and Uraraka are standing off to the side, dying inside at how Bakugo's behaving on TV. The scene then cuts away to the last days of December in the 1A homeroom, where it's revealed by Sero and Kaminari that after being interviewed for over an hour, the reporters only used Todoroki's answers, and Bakugo was almost entirely excluded from the interview, with his only appearance being his head briefly appearing in the corner of a shot, whilst they changed the camera angle to focus on Todoroki talking. The girls of the class then discuss how the interview did protect Bakugo from getting bad public opinion, but it still would have soured his reputation with the press after his antics. And I guess this is our first look at how the system protects heroes maybe a little too much, and lets them get away with things that they shouldn't. Tying into what Stain would say all the way back in Season 2, that people like this aren't true heroes. Because, I mean, wouldn't it be better for people to call out this toxic man-child so you don't have a new Endeavor situation? He's so needlessly aggressive in the way he interacts with people. And considering he's supposed to be a pro-hero and a big part of their job is public opinion, you'd think that the teachers and the system in general would want to nip this kind of thing in the bud. After the interview ends, we see on Deku's phone that it cuts back to a studio discussion panel about how these two young heroes will hopefully begin to work as pros as soon as possible in order to help combat recent civil disorder, and hopefully prevent another incident such as the one in Daika City, where Daika City was heavily damaged by the rioting of just 20 people who we obviously know are affiliated with Shigaraki from the cold open. Ida then approaches Deku and says that the destruction was apparently even greater than in Kamino Ward, but with fewer victims because of lesser population density. And considering Kamino Ward was largely caused by the final battle of All for One and All Might, this very much implies that Shigaraki is getting very, very strong and has also found some very powerful new friends. And I'm pretty excited to see where this plot thread goes. Because, to be honest, we haven't had a really cool fresh villain in ages. The news report concludes by stating that this is a critical juncture for pro heroes, and that these attacks seem designed to sway public opinion away from the Hero Commission, but that it doesn't seem to be working since the Look Kid got people invested in Endeavor of all people, and showcased how he was risking his life to protect people. Although I do very much doubt that this goodwill is going to last forever, maybe one to two more arcs tops before it all crumbles to dust. And then the classroom door opens, revealing new special instructor Mount Lady with Midnight, who do very inappropriate poses for a school classroom, and reveal that in response to the growing popularity of Class 1A, they've decided to implement some emergency media training to teach them how a hero should behave. Clearly, it's not only the students who notice Bakugo's bad reception by the press. 
And it's honestly hilarious that literally straight after that airs, they try and have a roundabout way to teach Bakugo that his behaviour wasn't okay by getting everybody else involved. Obviously this training is good for all students, but it's still funny to me that the only way they could combat this without a full-on meltdown from Bakugo was to involve everybody else, to make it look like they're not pointing out his faults. Also, the highlight of this sequence has got to be seeing Aizawa's sleeping bag being converted into a sleeping bag suit. What can I say? The man knows his life hacks. We then move on to the mock media training, where Mount Lady set up a stage for them to perform mock interviews, calling Shoto up first. The two of them then proceed to have the funniest interview of all time, with Shoto taking everything literally, not realising that he had to pretend that he just finished a job, asking whether she had heart problems when she tells him that he makes her heart race, and then becoming worried that if he smiles, he'll kill people after she tells him he'd slay ladies with his smile. And I think it was doubly funny that she finds his antics adorable and quickly becomes smitten with him. And it was also interesting that when referencing his special moves, he leaves out Flash Fire Fist, saying it's his old man's move and he isn't at that level yet. And I think it does show that he does respect him as a fighter at the very least, and won't claim his moves until he can earn it. Tokoyami then asks if they're supposed to use their special moves in interviews, to which Mount Lady replies that they should, because they're going to start off as nobodies, and they need to earn people's attention. And that sounds pretty dangerous to me. Imagine a young All Might trying to earn his place, firing a United States of Smash at his first interview to get some attention. Yikes. Sounds like an accident waiting to happen. Although it was nice that they finally gave me a reason as to why they scream out the names of their moves, so that other fans, pros, and civilians can get to know and trust them on a deeper level. And this deeper analysis of the nature of hero work by Mount Lady surprises Mineta, who obviously remembers his hero internship and how she didn't really seem to take things that seriously back then. Aizawa goes on to explain that the hero industry is being pulled up by Endeavor and they're following his example. And these are even more hints towards the downfall of Endeavor and the hero industry right here. They're finally stabilizing after All Might's retirement, only to have something else terrible happen. And I'm honestly getting pretty excited from all this foreshadowing of what's to come. We then have a little montage of everybody doing well in their interviews. Except Bakugo who continues to act crazy. Prompting Midnight to wonder if they should teach him to avoid the media like Aizawa does. And considering he's such a problem child, this is probably the only option outside a personality transplant. They honestly need someone that Bakugo respects like All Might or some figurehead to tell him to pull his head in. But even then, he doesn't even listen to All Might or his own mum who constantly yells at him. He's honestly hopeless. But in the end, Aizawa decides that there's somebody else he should be learning from as we move on to Deku's interview. And hilariously, this is the last person Bakugo would ever want to learn from. And Deku's interview is premium cringe, but in a good way. Poor Deku, who's normally so brave and confident these days, freezes up completely and flops hard before descending into his patented muttering. And then when he's showing off his new move Black Whip, well, suffice to say he has performance issues. And after such an intense build-up too, ugh, poor guy. Although, at least he was happy with it. That being said though, the less said about this the better because whilst funny at first, it quickly reminded me too much of the compulsory oral presentations I was forced to do in school. Ugh. Now I just want to have a cold shower and lie down. We then move on to what I guess is All Might's bedroom, where Principal Nezu just barges in whilst he's working on compiling information on the other users of One For All. I guess spurred on by the fact that now he knows Deku's going to manifest all their quirks in time. So I guess for once, it would actually pay for him to be a little bit prepared. After a bit of banter about how All Might's not looking too good, Nezu reveals that the hero's work studies are coming back, much to All Might's shock. And here we have it. The hook for the next arc. And I'm guessing the kickstart of unraveling the mystery of Shigaraki's movements over the last season and a half. The scene then transitions to a UA staff meeting where Nezu's explaining the plan to have all the Hero Course students undertake work studies at the request of the Hero Commission, with the staff guessing that it has something to do with the incident in Daika City. Considering the staff explain that there are more heroes than ever before in Japan, and yet the Commission wants even more, I'm expecting this arc to start to ramp up really hard, really fast. And side note, isn't it a little dodgy that the Hero Commission are essentially training underage soldiers for what can only be presumed to be an upcoming war against villains? They're fully expecting to order these students to fight and die against full-blown adult villains. I get that students acquire their provisional licenses so that way they can leap into the action whenever they're around slash able, but that's voluntary. It's not a compulsory obligation. Of course, the hero students are all brave and they'd be willing to fight for the most part, but to me it's a bit controversial. You wouldn't chuck a first year med student into brain surgery, would you? <laughs> I hope not at least. The scene concludes with Nezu's decision to ask heroes of good repute to host the students being finalised. 
And then a request to Aizawa to stay behind and discuss the Hero Commission's other project, which sounds ominous to say the least. Also, side note, Nezu snuggling with Aizawa was adorable, especially since he has a chair, but he'd still prefer to have a cuddle. We then move on again to yet another Nezu scene where he's on a Skype call with All Might and the detective, with Nezu telling the pair that it's been four months since the dorm system was implemented and nobody seems suspicious, with All Might stating that all his students have the heart of heroes. And I think it's a little bit interesting they're addressing the traitor plot this way. There's been next to nothing about it other than this, so that could mean one of two things. Either this is a wrap-up point where the author essentially wanted to end the idea that there could be a traitor, or they're throwing off the scent right before we're thrown into a darker level of My Hero, where a traitor could pop up later in the series. Any guess is as good as mine, so who knows. Nezu then asks if All Might's going to be coming back today, with the implication being that it's Christmas Eve, and then this throws us into the Christmas party that the episode title promised at last. We see Class 1A dressed up in festive gear of red and green Santa outfits with quirk-related items attached to their Santa hats. The conversation quickly turns to the upcoming compulsory work studies with the students discussing where they're going to go, with Froppy and Uraraka returning to Ryuko's agency, whilst Deku was rejected by both Centipeda and Gran Torino because they don't have time. Meanwhile, as Kaminari and Ashido try to force Bakugo into a Santa suit, he states that he also doesn't know where he's going, because his mentor Best Genus recently went missing. And then we get a little bit of an emotional flashback where Best Genus has him tied up and is brushing his hair down, giving him advice on how his hero name should be a wish about who he wants to be, and that the hero names he's been choosing are childish because he hasn't looked outside himself yet. He then goes on to tell him that when he gets his provisional license, he can come back and work with him and tell him his hero name then. And this gave me the feels. Initially with his internships, you kind of got the feeling that he immensely regretted picking him for his hero work. But with this new perspective, it shows that he's actually concerned for Best Genus and is sad that he can't intern with him and prove himself to him. But obviously, he'll be back because otherwise we'd never hear Bakugo's hero name. It just thematically makes sense. And from the sound of it, it'll come up sooner rather than later. After a brief discussion of how Mineta thinks that discussing school on a holy night is sacrilege and the realization that Sugar Man can cook regular food too, we're treated to Santa Airy arriving and mixing up Christmas with every holiday she can think of, saying trick or treat and handing out eggs she'd painted. It's cute, but it's also sad because it reminds you that she was locked up and abused for most of her life and has no idea about anything really. Then we get a cute montage of everybody eating and getting secret Santa presents. The best of these gifts being Mineta receiving a photo of Ayama, Ida receiving solid gold bars, Bakugo getting a pair of Ida's glasses, and Eri getting a giant sword. Merry Christmas indeed. It was pretty wholesome, but there was very ominous narration about how this is essentially going to be one of the last happy moments before we're thrust into the darker age of my hero. And it does make me sad that we probably won't be able to see all the heroes together happy like this for a long while. After the credits finish rolling, we get a post credit scene where Todoroki asks Bakugo and Deku to come to Endeavor's agency, which is pretty exciting to say the least, setting up the hook for the next episode. And then that brings us to the end of the episode, and I thought this was really good. Obviously not a lot happened, but it really set the scene for the next stage of the story, whilst also having a lot of funny fluff moments. And with the leadoff being the big three going to Endeavor's agency for their internships, you know we're heading into another awesome arc. That being said though, that's just my opinion, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? Make sure to leave a comment and let me know.